Here before we get back into the book of Jude. So K groups begin, and I wanted to remind you that if you're in a Sunday group, most likely it does not begin tonight. So your leader would specifically have told you if your group begins tonight. So it's next Sunday that your K groups begin. Now, we give the Sunday groups some flexibility on holidays and things when they want to go before or after the Wednesday groups. So Wednesday groups begin this week, Awana groups begin this week, and then the Sunday groups will begin after that. So I uh, just wanted to make sure you know that so you're not showing up somewhere and you're the only one there, and so that would be bad. And so we're back in the book of Jude, and we're in, um, there's only one chapter, chapter one, and we're going to be in verses 12 through 16. Let's just read those verses together to kind of just set the... Um, context, and then we'll go and look at these verses. So Jude writing about the false teachers or fake Christians in the midst of this congregation, he says, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts. As they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves. Waterless clouds swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead uprooted. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouthed, boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. Let's pray, and we'll look at these verses. Father God, we thank you for your scripture, your word, that we have received from you, God. Um, Through your supernatural hand, you've preserved this, and we stand here today Um, just uh, kneeling down to your authority and through the authority of your word that's written in these Bibles, God. And I thank you that we can get together today and gather today to remind ourselves of truth and to look at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In his name we pray, amen. So back in verse 4, we talked about how that certain people had crept in unnoticed. And so I think it's really important as we look at this passage to recognize that these were more than likely not like somebody who was an official teacher or somebody who walked in that was looked at as being in charge or having authority. These are people who crept in. So these are people who just kind of came into the church body and began to teach things or spread things that weren't accurate from what the faith that we'd received is the word that Jude used, the faith that had been given down through the apostles. And so Jude, his concern here is identifying the false teachers, and then the people can remove these people from the church. And so truth is critically important. I mean, we know that, we say that, but yet we live in a culture that is dismissive of truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth. And as Christians, this is why we continue to preach books like Jude, because the truth is still relevant to us today, because our culture and even church culture is telling us to compromise on certain truths or certain beliefs. And so Scripture tells us and gives us some very broad tests to give in order to see if someone is truly of God or not of God. And the first test that Scripture talks about is, what do they say about the person of Jesus Christ? What do they say about Jesus? And so that's one of the foremost tests. I mean, if a church is not preaching Jesus, then it's not a church. They're not a gospel church, of course. The second one, and this is one where it gets dicey because some denominations, some religions would say they're a church of Jesus, but they compromise on the true gospel. They don't communicate the true gospel, which is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Let me say that again. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's salvation. That's the core of the the doctrine of salvation in a nutshell. And then the third one is, does this person exhibit character qualities 
that glorified Jesus. And that's where the book of Jude is written to target these teachers because Jude doesn't tackle any certain doctrine as he's talking and teaching. What he's really hitting at here is their behavior, the fruit of the things that they are doing. And so these false teachers, as I talked about last week, were putting forth this idea among people that grace allowed you to just indulge your flesh, that you could just live whatever way you want to live. And in fact, Paul dealt dealt with this and, and confronted this as well because grace was looked at as like a license just to do whatever you want to do because God forgive, gives it. And so like grace, let grace even pile up even more the more we do, the, the more God forgives. And then it was also tied in to what's called this early form of what's called Gnosticism, which basically said that the spirit is what's good and holy and righteous. And this is a really broad uh, stroke here. The, the, the spirit is what's good, and the flesh, the physical, the material, is what's evil. And so just abuse your body because it's going away anyway. To just do whatever you want to with it. So it's really crazy to us, but we know there's plenty of crazies out there today that may not look exactly like this, but it's every bit as crazy as if you look at it and, and to pick it apart. And so it's important that we recognize how that this truth we need these truths, to st- and as we stay consistent with God and his truth and his word and the gospel. And so verse 4 says, These false teachers, these fake Christians, they pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny Jesus. And so they deny Jesus through their actions, through their behavior. And so living in sensuality and then creating these theological uh, rationalizations for it is a denial of Jesus. And so we need to remember that, that even though they may have said the right things and their doctrine per se was correct, that their living, their lifestyle, the sensuality that was being uh, lived out said more about them than what the things they said out of their mouth. Paul tells us clearly in Galatians chapter 5 that the the fruit of the Spirit, and he, he says love and joy and peace and patience, these things are the things that are indicative of a heart that's been uh, transformed in a new nature that you've received through the Holy Spirit, that you're, be, you're living out progressively more and more these fruit of the Spirit. And Galatians tells us that the works of the flesh are evident. 5.19 says it's just evident what the works of the, of the flesh are, and he begins to give a list of these things, but it's not an all-inclusive list. He's saying people who are born again, people who come to Jesus— there is this, the Holy Spirit tells us, he gives us a check in our spirit based upon the truth of God's word and just even just the obvious knowing that God is holy, that there's what's pure and righteous and what's evil and wrong. And these works of the flesh are just apparent. They're works that are evident that are not of God. And so if we're going to be used as instruments for God, he's going to mold and shape us primarily using his word to, uh, to bring us more to in Christ's likeness so we can live things like love for one another and joy and have joy even in the midst of difficult times and suffering, we can have joy in those times. And so in the New Testament, we see these behavioral commands and these instructions for the church that he's given. Paul makes it clear that we don't look back at the Old Testament Torah law and we don't live our lives by checking off a list of laws from the Old Testament under the New Covenant. And I talked about this last week that we have the Spirit now who leads us and guides us in the truth. And everything that we need from the, the, the character, the morality that's given in the Old Testament is given to us in the New Testament through the commands of the apostles and the words of Jesus. And so we have what we need. We don't live by law. We live, we're under grace, but we strive for holiness because the Spirit within us strives for holiness. And so it's important that we recognize that otherwise we can, as I mentioned last week, we can get scared of grace. Oh, well, like grace it can be a license just to do whatever you want to do because we don't, we're not under law, we're under grace. But the Holy Spirit is much more powerful. He writes God's word and his law upon our hearts. And so now we have just not only God's word that he's given to us, but we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us who gives, gives us a check in our spirit as we live incorrectly and wrongly and indulge in the flesh. And as a community, as the body of Christ, we come together to remind ourselves of the truth of the new covenant. We remember 
what Jesus did for us and why he had to come in the first place. And so we do these things so we can become holy as God is holy and, and be more like him and have the fruit of the Spirit working through us. And over and over again, in Galatians 5, three different times that Paul tells us that we are to walk by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. So this is not a passive thing. It's very much an active thing that we walk in the Spirit, we engage the Spirit, we're shaped by the Spirit, we keep in step with the Spirit, and we don't indulge the flesh. But the false teachers in Jude are teaching the exact opposite of this. They're saying indulge the flesh. And they're preying on people who are spiritually immature, who have not been taught real well, and also just our natural inclination to want to do what we want to do, right? And do whatever feels good. And a, a new Christian, a baby Christian, an immature Christian who's not being taught the word, it's no, um, it, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that they would want to indulge the flesh. And it takes a, a years and years of discipleship and years and years of being in God's word with Jesus Christ in order for our desires to change where the things that we used to find great happiness and excitement in, those things don't bring us happiness and excitement any longer. Those things are not what satisfies us. And sure, we all are capable at any time to run off and give in to the desires of the flesh, but it's sure not indicative of our life and the choices that we make and the trajectory of our life. And so we constantly remind you here at Grace is to look at the trajectory of your life. Yes, you sin. We all sin. Yes, we, we, we make mistakes and we fail. You've been driving this past week and somebody cut you off and you screamed at them and you're like, oh, why did I do that again? I should be not doing that as much as I used to do. But God convicts you of your sin. But when you sit here and you say, I, I'm just going to do this, indulge this, embrace it, live this way, because I'm just going to justify it and rationalize it with my faith, there's the problem. There's the lack of fruit in your life. And so there's the Holy Spirit that works within you and he's convicting you, and they're not walking in the Spirit. I think about way back in the day when I was in college, I worked retail, and I worked at a Hibbit Sporting Goods. This was early days of Hibbit Sporting Goods, back when there was near, near the many stores as there are today. And uh, I was just, you know, 30-hour-a-week, full-time college student working in there, and they were started really focusing on training and educating us on like this shoe or that shoe and this merchandise, and they really want us to be really intentional as salespeople with uh, our sales and, and, and our targeting and add-on sales and all those things that come with retail. And they told us, they said, now, there may be a mystery shopper showing up here one day. And we're in Chattanooga. The home office was in Birmingham. So they said, probably more than likely, this is going to happen. Well, one day I'm in there, and I'm, you know, just hanging out. It's pretty slow, Eastgate Mall, which once existed in Chattanooga. And it's a pretty boring day, and this guy comes in. And, and I don't know why, but just like right from the beginning, almost as soon as he entered the store and I spoke to him, that I just had this weird impulse that this guy, like, this guy, there's something up with this guy. Like, he just doesn't seem to fit. He seems a little too inquisitive. He seems a little too awkward. And sure, this is the world, not only was he a mystery shopper, he was like one of the vice presidents of the company showing up there, and I was his salesperson during that encounter, during that, during that time. And I think it's kind of a little bit of how the Holy Spirit works with us as we're in the Word, that we just have a kind of a, like, that doesn't seem right, or that doesn't feel right, or that, you know, that's not the right thing for our family to be doing or saying or watching. And, and you just get this check in your spirit as you continue to grow in the faith. And when we put that out of our minds, we're like, oh, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to entertain that. We're, we're allowing the Holy Spirit to be pushed down, and we're stifling the Spirit's voice in our life. And we should embrace the Spirit, embrace what God is doing through us. And so you see these people who have, have come into this church, and here they're, they're, they're taking advantage of immature believers and trying to sow these false doctrines, and Jude has to come along and say, look, here's the truth. And he gives, them five, he gives five very descriptive, picturesque um, examples of what that these, these guys, these fake believers are doing and the way they're acting and what's going to be the outcome of their behavior. And so let's look at these real quick because they're all allegorical and sometimes, you know, that's kind of weird to read them all together and it's hard to figure out, but it's very obvious what he's getting at on, on, on some of these. He says, these fake Christians, they're destructive, first and foremost. Look, they're destructive. He said, these are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. 
shepherds feeding themselves. So these false teachers, he says, can be identified by the way they're behaving at these love feast meals. Now, you might be wondering, what is a love feast? What is that about? Well, in the early days of the church, the Lord's Supper, which we know Jesus instituted, he set up the, his final Passover meal with his disciples, and he took the Exodus meal, and he gave it significance for himself and said that this is his body and his blood for his people. So when first century Christians gathered to eat bread and wine, these weren't the only items on the menu. People would bring food, and they would gather, and they would share this meal together, this entire meal. And this was a time of fellowship. This was a time of encouragement. This was a time of feeding the poor in the church and just encouraging one another in the Lord. And so this was what would happen. And then within that context would be what we call the Lord's Supper, that they would be intentional about taking these things. So that's the context of this agape meal or this love feast, but he says that these people, they're like these hidden reefs. They have the potential to sink people's faith. And so unseen, of course, a hidden reef obviously wouldn't be seen. And as they're in these love feasts, they're participating and interacting and communicating with people in a way that could actually sink the, the people's faith. The faith. They're changing around, here's the intention of this or that, and they're not living the way that they should live. In fact, Paul makes us very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 of the danger that exists when we come together for the Lord's Supper, which we will take today, and we do it in a way that's unworthy. Look at the verse, I think it's on the screen. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many are weak and ill, and some have even died. And so these, just like in Paul's day, Paul's, the church of Corinth, the church here, they're getting together, and all they care about is themselves. This, this love feast becomes just a time for gluttony and indulging. And, and Paul, when he f- confronted the church at Corinth, the problem was that these people were getting there early, eating up all the food. The poor people and the people who actually needed the food were getting there, and there was nothing left for them. And so you had people here that were just being completely and utterly selfish. And so these false Christians, these fake Christians, were in the midst of them encouraging and promoting this type of behavior. And so this is a very selfish way of living. And that's what Paul is, is dealing with here in Corinth. He's not saying, okay, try to think back through this past week and really you know, think about, did you do anything wrong whatsoever? Did you have any kind of evil thought or did you say something bad to your spouse? Was there anything, you better confess that and make that right with God or you, know, you could be guilty of the blood, body and blood of Jesus and you could just like die, right? That's the way that I was taught that whole thing going down. That's not what Paul's talking about there. He's talking about people who were coming in and just living carefree, selfish. All they were doing is treating this time to remember the Lord's body and they were treating it as a time just to feast and indulge their own selfish ways. And that's what Paul's confronting here in this passage of Scripture in Corinthians. He's saying you're doing it in a way that does not give reverence and respect to the body of Christ, literally, and the body of Christ figuratively. And so he's, he said, examine yourself. And so this church that Jude is writing to, that the same problems are going on there, where people, there's no love during these love feasts. There's no love for one another. They're just doing this for their own selfishness. And, and Paul says, to examine yourself, Jude says, this is a problem. These fake Christians are living in a way which will shipwreck others' faith. faith. They're like shepherds who aren't worried about the sheep. All they care about is just feeding them themselves, taking care of themselves. And so it's amazing that people would behave that way, right? Amazing. Like we expect if, if food is served, sometimes we expect children to act that way, right? They want to get to the front of the, of the, the meal table and get their food. I mean, but respectable adults don't act that way, right? We don't do that. So do we say, well, then this passage is not really relevant to us. But we do this in a lot of other ways, right? Because it's the same root attitude can exist in us as in these fake Christians where we come to church and it's just about you entertain me, you tell me something I'm going to hear and and I'm going to like enjoy this, 
and then I'm going to slip out as quick as, as, uh, as I can because I got what I needed. All right? That's the same rude attitude as these false teachers and these fake Christians. It wasn't about love for others. It wasn't about putting others first. It wasn't about taking care of others. It was about get in, do your thing, get what you want, and then get out, right? And, and it's a shame that we can allow the church community, the church body, to be something that we just come, we sit in a seat, and then we leave, and it's all about us, right? And, and we got to be really careful and fight against this. I, had a, uh, I knew a real estate agent in our church in Dallas, and her son, who was a high school student, told me, he's like, yeah, my mom's, she's a member of two churches because she gets more clients that way, right? And, and, and so this was really blatant that she came to church so she could get more real estate clients, and one church wasn't enough. She went to another church. And so we got to be really careful that we don't just use relationships for our own purposes. And I think the reverse is true, that we need to be careful in our church community, that we don't use church as an opportunity like, oh, I'll see my dentist at church. I'll, I'll talk to him there about my problem I'm having, right? And this person's come to worship and encourage, and here we're trying to find out, you know, what, what I can do about my toothache, right? And there's times for that encouragement and help, but you know what I'm talking about. Like if you're setting up your lawn service on Sunday morning, or if you're, you know, talking to your stockbroker, or your, here's one, or your school teacher, right? Because we get a lot of school teachers here. And so if you're like finding your school teacher, they're like, oh man, I don't even want to go to church because all people want to ask me is about tomorrow's assignment, Right? So let's be really respectful of one another and make sure that the conversations we're having and the, the things that we're doing are intentional so that people want to be part of the church body and want to encourage one another. And it's not just us doing business and finding more opportunities to have networking for our better off financially. So let's be careful with that and let's really watch out for that. So these fa false teachers, they were destructive. They were, they were bringing people, their faith to... to potentially shipwrecked it. The second one is these fake Christians, they disappoint. Plain and simple. They offer something, they promise something, and they disappoint. Waterless clouds swept along by winds. So they make promises to help people. They're going to help them grow in their faith. What you're going to, if you do this or you follow this, that you're going to find out you're going to have more joy and you're going to have more success in life. But the end is like a cloud that doesn't have rain that it's going to be a failure. It produces nothing. The third one, these fake Christians, they're dead. Fruitless, which is a really key word there. Fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. And so their lives were bearing no fruit, love and joy and peace and patience, none of that. They were like trees that only would take. They wouldn't give. It was all about just taking in more, taking in more. There was no concern for giving and bearing fruit, and bearing fruit to encourage one another. So they're very selfish people. And as I said before, the DNA of sin is selfishness. Number four, these fake Christians defile others. Number four, they defile others. Look at verse 13. Wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame. So they're like that dirty foam and rubbish that the, lay, the waves leave behind on the beach, Right? They're just nothing but junk. It's defiling. The things that they're teaching are just bringing defilement, defilement on other people. Nothing good is happening here. Number five, they deceive and then they disappear. They're wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. And so a couple different ways this could be taken. Um, we know that stars and planets were used for navigation purposes, and so they provide bad directions. If you look at them and you try to follow them, you ain't going to end up where you need to be, right? You're going to be lost. Or they, and it says they utter darkness. It's like a comet streaking through the sky. Here they come in and they astonish people with new doctrine, new teaching. Hey, here's the latest thing. Have you heard this? Have you heard this teaching before? And people get all excited like, yeah, new. I love new stuff, right? New makes me excited and makes me feel alive. And they just hear this out, and they're excited about it. But these false teachers, they're just, they're just there today, and they're gone tomorrow, right? They're, they're, there's no stability in their life. And so all this new stuff they're bringing to energize and engage people, it's, it's, it's worthless. It's pointless. And so stick, James has told us, to the faith that has been received. Don't get tired of the gospel message. The depths of the gospel can never be mined out. Continue to go into the Word and study the Word. And if you want something fresh, Look into the Word every day 
and ask God to reveal to you the truth, just like the book of Jude. You can read through the book of Jude, same for me. I read through the book of Jude, and I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be a hard book to teach. There's not a lot here, right? And then I'm like, i got to expand this to an extra week because there's so much in this book. Once you dig in, you slow down, and you shut out the other distractions of life, and you really dig into God's Word, there's so much. So he points out, and he says, these fake Christians, they're destructive to people's faith. They disappoint they're dead, there's no fruit, they defile others, they deceive, and then they're, they're gone, they disappear. And so Jude makes it clear that God's judgment is coming upon these people. God's judgment is coming upon these people. Let's walk through because moving through the other sermons so quickly, we weren't able to focus in on the judgment side of it, but I was kind of bringing this together to get today to see God's judgment to these false teachers. So we looked at these passages like verse 5 where he said they were like unbelieving Israel. And what did he say about unbelieving Israel? He said they would be destroyed. Verse 6, he said they were like fallen angels. What was the punishment for the fallen angels? They would face eternal captivity in gloomy darkness until the day of the, the judgment of the great day. Verse 7, he says like Sodom and Gomorrah, they'll face punishment of eternal fire. Verse 11, they said like Cain and Balaam and Korah, he says, woe, which means certain judgment. You can count on it. Judgment and destruction is awaiting you. And so he, James is, or Jude is painting this picture here that judgment is coming, not just for false teachers, but for everyone who rejects Jesus Christ. God is coming to judge all of the ungodly. Sinners will have to face God's righteous judgment on the, his final day of wrath. Look at verse 14. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of, of all their deeds and ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so he says ungodly here in the short, the short verse three times. And so he says there's a day of judgment that's coming. Now, if today is your first day at church, or if you've uh, not been in a while, um, you know, sometimes there's a stereotype of Christians, and you're like, yep, see, that Christians are all about judgment. And in fact, 90% of respondents between 16 and 29 said that Christians um, are judgmental, and they're harsh, and they're unfriendly and unkind and unloving. And so that's the opinion that the church has among the culture. And evangelical Christians um, are told, don't judge other people. And if there's any verse that those outside the church can quote, it's Jesus' words in Matthew 7, judge not or you'll be judged, right? And that's thrown out there like, okay, who are you to tell us what's right or wrong? And so I think it's important that we understand and put judgment in its, in its right context, but also understanding clearly that Jesus, the judge, is going to return. And Jesus is wanted to be painted in this light where Jesus, he's good with everything, right? He's good with, with whatever you want to do, and uh, he's just as permissible like a parent who just sits back and says, just run and do whatever you want to do and act whatever way you want to act. And as I talked about last week, there is even churches and denominations being built around this idea, judge not, lest you be judged. There's no judgment here, right? We don't judge people. We, everybody's accepted and everything's approved of. And, and it's crazy that our culture lives in such a way where they teach the Bible that, uh, you know, if you do anything against human rights, that's the problem, right? I mean, human rights, Jesus would never say anything. And so if you're saying anything that questions somebody's rights, then you need to evaluate, reevaluate your opinion of Jesus and what Jesus said, because Jesus wouldn't do that. And so it's this judgment-free Christianity that they want to see among us and, and with us. But, you know, anytime that you tell somebody they're wrong, you're going to get, hey, you're, a judge, you're, you're doing judgment on us, right? And so we need to understand, first, how Christians, how we need to communicate these truths, but also we need to understand that we can't compromise on these truth, truths as well. And so speaking to those who um, 
Again, there's spiritual immaturity. Maybe you're newer to Christian, you, Christianity. You didn't grow up in the faith. You need to understand the whole counsel of God and understand that God does judge sin and why he judges sins. But also, we need to recognize those of us who are insiders, those of us who all we do is sit around and criticize our culture, that we need to understand that we have a tendency to act in a way that is not Christ-like in this manner. Because when Jesus said, judge not or you will be judged, there was truth to being taught in that passage for us. And I like what, just to kind of sum it up, what J.C. Ryer says, this explains it well, this guy who lived in the 1800s, he says, what our Lord means to condemn, condemn is a fault-finding spirit, a readiness to blame others for trifling offenses or matters of indifferences, indifference, a habit of passing rash and hasty judgments, a disposition to magnify the errors and infirmities of our neighbors and make the worst of them. And so it's just this critical, angry spirit that exists. And I like how Scotty Smith says this. He says, responsible discernment is one thing. Mean-spirited criticism is quite another. Calling down fire from heaven on anyone isn't our prerogative. And so I think as Christians, we need to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to become snarky and mean-spirited. And usually that's, again, as a result of, a, of an imbalance that exists in our life. An emphasis on justice without or with absence of love. There's no love in our message. But then the other side is when Christians become tolerant or dismissive of a sin or just, oh, everything goes, is an emphasis of love with or over justice. But the Bible is clear. God loves us with a love that is far greater than human love, but he's also a God who judges sin and evil with perfect justice. And so God is perfectly righteous, holy, and just, and there's no darkness at all, Scripture says, found in God. He's, he's perfect, not a speck of imperfection. And so God himself is the standard for what is good, right, and moral. And if it's not for God being the standard of moral for perfection, creating beings who, who would have nothing to measure up to God, we cannot measure up to him, Romans says. All have fallen short of God's glory. And so God is perfectly righteous, and we fall short of that. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. But in his amazing mercy and grace, he did not leave us in that condition. He gave us an opportunity to respond to his act of love, his gospel through Christ and the cross, right? In the cross, we see God's love and his justice intersect perfectly, right? Because God would have been completely just and justified to allow us to die in our sins. We fell short of his greatness, his holiness. But instead of allowing us to die and be eternally separated from him forever, what does he do? He sends his own son to die on our behalf so that all who place their faith in him find forgiveness and wholeness and eternal life. And so the greatest act of love was given. Also, the greatest act of judgment was given, right? Because why did Jesus come? If you're a, a skeptic and you're sitting here like, uh, why would God do that? Why would God send his son to die for us? Then the question is, why would he if it wasn't because of God's holiness, his perfection, and needing the perfect sacrifice to cover sin? And yes, it's baffling. It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine the love that would be required of a father sending his son to die for our sin. Not for his sin, for our sin. But God, in his mercy and his grace, he made a way through the cross so that we could have salvation. And so God's holiness, his righteousness, demanded a sacrifice on the cross, right? It demanded a sacrifice. But his mercy and his love was also that sacrifice made a way for all who would put their faith in Christ. And in fact, verse 14 really speaks to God's mercy and patience even in light of the fact that he's coming to execute judgment. Look at, look at it again. He said, it was also about these, who's these? These false teachers, these fake, fake Christians, that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. So let's just stop there. Right, Enoch, who lived during the time of the Genesis, if you go in Genesis, you may remember this guy. He's the guy who walked perfectly with God and only one of two guys 
who never saw death. He was taken up to heaven because he walked with God and God found favor upon him. And he says that Jude points to Enoch and his words that were passed down through this oral tradition. This is not in the scriptures. It was in oral tradition that was passed down through this book called the Book of Enoch. And he was the great, 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 great grandson of Adam. And he lived for 365 years. God took him up. And he says, he prophesies at some point in his life that God's going to come back and he's going to give judgment, bring judgment to all who teach false teaching and all who lead people astray and all who deny Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Think about that. All those many, many years back that God, being patient and loving, warned well ahead of time, right? Many thousands of years ahead of time that judgment day was going to happen. Why? Because God's patient, and God doesn't operate on the time schedule like we do. Peter writes about this in 2 Peter 3.9. He says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And so if you're sitting here today, listen, if you're sitting here today, This is God extending his grace and his mercy and his patience to you if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. This is his reach of salvation to you, his gift of salvation to you. And you have no excuse because you can respond and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus took the punishment that you deserved. You deserve to be on that cross dying, not him, because your sins are many and you have fallen short of God's perfection his holiness. You deserve to be there. Jesus said, no, I'm going in your place. And when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Jesus takes the punishment that we deserved, the death that we deserved, the eternal damnation that we deserved. All our sins were placed upon Jesus Christ, and we get the righteousness of Christ. So now those who place their faith in Jesus, we stand blameless and pure because the blood of Christ covers us. What a beautiful, wonderful message of truth and grace. Yet our world wants to tell us God would not do that. God wouldn't punish people. God wouldn't judge people. But yet it's selective reading of the same Bible, the same Bible that they read that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The same Bible tells us that Jesus is going to be returning. And these fake Christians, they don't know Jesus. They don't know the love of Jesus. They only love themselves. And that's the option, is right? We can love Jesus, my life for Jesus, or we can love ourselves, my life for me, my life for me. Look what Jude writes in verse 16. These are grumblers, malcontent, and here it is, following their own sinful desires. They're not following the Spirit because they don't have the Spirit. They are loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. They're making those networks so they can gain advantage financially. They're making those connections so that they can benefit from it because it's all about them. It's not about Jesus. It's all about them. And like a criminal who shows up in court before a judge with no defense lawyer and no defense, these people will stand before God one day and Jesus will not be their advocate. He was not their savior and he will not be their advocate. And Jesus will say, no, they had their chance and they did not put their faith in me. And God says, depart from me. I never knew you. Wow. Wow. What, a, what a, a solemn and, and serious matter, the judgment of the Lord. And so if anyone tells you that Jesus, he doesn't judge people. Jesus is not, not, not judgmental. Look at 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who, who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. That's the Jesus that wears a rainbow flag, right? No, I don't think so. That's the Jesus that says everything's okay, right? Just be who you are. Just embrace whatever feels good to you. And I'm sorry to be so blunt. And if, again, if this is your first time here, these, these issues don't come up every Sunday. I'm not one of those preachers that gets on a soapbox preaching about the cultural sins every single week. But the truth is, our, our message and our beliefs are under attack. They are. 
because we're to be Christians who pass no judgment on anyone, right? Just, just, just believe in Jesus, but don't ever say this is true or not true. And so our culture is confused. And we can't allow them to be confused about what the Bible says, because if we're, they're confused about the Bible, what the Bible says, these are the false Christians, the fake Christians who existed in the time of Jude, who did their thing and lived their life and indulged the flesh, lived for themselves, and then one day they stand before God and God says, I don't know you. I don't know you. Did you put your faith in Jesus? Did you uh, put your faith in the gospel of our Lord Jesus? Jesus, the judge, stands. And he is not their advocate. He is not their friend. He will not save you on that day. Now is the day of salvation. It's a hard truth, but you know what? It's a loving truth. It's a loving truth because we need to know that. We don't need to wait till one day and then to figure out what we believe because it might be too late. So Jesus, the judge, he's coming back. And what do we do? We look to the cross. Listen, look to the cross. Do you want to see God's love? Look to the cross. Do you want to see God's holiness? Look to the cross. Look to the cross and see his righteousness. That's what we do. That's what we do every day. We rehearse the gospel. We tell, talk to ourselves about what Jesus did for us. We don't allow our lives to become about us. And through his power, the work that he's doing in us, through which we participate in our, in our sanctification, becoming more like Christ, we engage with the word. We engage with the truth that the Spirit leads us into love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. We want other people to be part of our community. We want to love other people and take care of other people and be the hands and feet of Jesus to them. And so today, as we take the Lord's Supper, as we take communion, what an opportunity for, to, to literally be hands-on and take the communion elements. And maybe for some of you, for the very first time in your life, you get it today. Like the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you know something's different, right? You know like, I want Jesus. I want the cross. I want the gospel. And as you take that bread and that juice for the first time, say, I believe. I believe. And that's your salvation. That's your altar call. That's your moment of truth where you say, Jesus, I just give it all to you. I have been living selfishly for myself I've been trying to manipulate your word to make it fit my fleshly agenda. Today, I leave it all at the cross. I find my identity, my worth, my value in you. And if you don't know Jesus and if you're rejecting him today, I would encourage you not to participate in what we're doing today up here, okay? And if you're one of those people who you, like, I know I'm a Christian, but you know what? I got this secret stuff going on on the back side. Like, I, I've been having this affair on my wife. I've been indulging in pornography. I've been living this way. Maybe you fall into that category where you're here today where you're like, well, maybe I need to really talk to God and get some things right before I partake in the Lord's Supper. I'm not talking about if you told a lie or did something, you know, three weeks ago. I'm, we're not talking about that. We're talking about intentional sabotage of the gospel by the way that you're living your life. That's what I'm talking about. That you're fruitless and you don't even care. And I want to encourage you to, today to be the day where you really take inventory and really examine your heart if you fall in that camp. For those of you who are in Jesus Christ, your faith is in Jesus, the Spirit is working within you. This, listen, this is an amazing celebration of your identity in Christ because you come and you're like, the only reason I can do this is because Jesus. Like, I know I'm a failure. I know I fall short. I know I continually battle the same sins again and again, but I'm battling I'm fighting, I'm struggling in the, in the power of Jesus. I'm struggling, but I'm struggling because I want to see Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want to be found in Christ. And that's why I can't help but to do these things because the Spirit is within me. So today is a celebration, a remembrance of what Jesus did that you could never do on your own, that you could never, ever accomplish on your own. Jesus accomplished it for you. He lives in you, and that's the Spirit who's guiding you into all truth. And so celebrate communion today. So we're going to take a few minutes just to, to pray as the elders come up to the front. And we'll do it the way where you'll exit out the left side. Please remember that. Exit the left side of your aisle. Even this group, if you'll exit to the left, come to the right. 
come to the side, take, and then return to your seats. That way, it'll keep us all organized. And we'll have multiple elders all the way across. So just go to whoever is free or the shortest line and take the elements. And then when you go back to your seat, we'll all take these together. So you don't take it to the front. Take it when we get back to our seat. I'll, I'll, I'll lead everyone together. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. And God, we can't help those of us who... We have the Holy Spirit. We've been given new life in Christ. We have a new nature. We can't help but get excited over your truth because we know that it's all you, Jesus. It's, it's nothing about us. God, I thank you that this poor, rotten sinner was saved by your grace. It is all you. And God, I thank you for my salvation. I thank you today that I can celebrate Jesus and the pain and, and the, the torture and the suffering and the death that he went through so I could stand before you righteous and holy and blameless. And today, God, our only, our only cry is, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray for anyone here today who knows that they, there's no fruit in their life whatsoever. There's no desire to live for you. There's no real commitment to the name of Jesus. God, today be the day of their salvation. As they take the Lord's Supper today, God, may it be a celebration of what you've just done in their heart as they place their faith and trust in you not because of what they're doing or going to do tomorrow, but because of what you did for them on that cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.